my name is Beth Johnson. I'm the communication specialist at the SETI Institute, which basically means I run all of the social media. I write stories. I do um, a, a whole bunch of different things. But today it is my privilege to host this special, uh, a side in space uh, joint effort with the, the SETI Institute to talk about SETI in China and looking at scientific and cultural perspectives. And we have three speakers and Iris as well. Iris is our, our special guest host. <laughs> and uh, so welcome in everybody. Um, first off, uh, welcome in Professor Zhang. Professor Zhang is uh, at the uh, Institute for Frontiers in Astronomy and Astrophysics at Beijing Normal University. And he is here to talk about some of the science stuff that is going on with SETI and um, possibly with uh, the new FAST telescope as well. Um, joining him uh, is his PhD student, Bolin Huang. So welcome in Bolin and, and thank you for being here. And we also have Professor uh, Sharon Wang, who um, is at Tsinghua University. And uh, she is um, has been a Carnegie Postdoc Fellow and uh, you know, is now a, a professor. So welcome in Sharon. And of course, Iris, thank you for being here. Iris is the person who has really sort of organized this whole event. Um, she is a writer and independent curator with a research focus on the psychogeography and technoscience and plural cosmologies, which I think is just a great sentence in and of itself. Um, so she is uh, a fellow of several different uh, stripes and uh, is working at, at, Swing, at Tsinghua University as well. So um, thank you everybody for being here and uh, feel free to jump in and, and say hello, Sharon, then uh, we'll kick it off with you. Please uh, give us a better introduction than I gave and let us know what you're gonna be talking about. I right, did a great job, thanks Beth. <laughs> All right, let me start sharing my screen. All right, good afternoon or good morning or um, good day from all over the world. Um, my name is Sharon. Um, I am a um, professor working at Department of Astronomy at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Uh, I am a observer uh, working on the detection and characterization of extrasolar planets. So today it's a, a great pleasure and privilege to join the SETI Institute um, and for all of you um, to talk about um, the research work real, uh, and also um, in culture and art um, related to SETI in China. I'm gonna uh, kickstart this conversation um, by sort of pave the way a little bit in terms of why we're interested in looking for planets that are um, possibly hosting life. And then my colleagues, Professor Zhang, and also his PhD student, Bolin, uh, will take over and dive right into the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and techno signatures um, before Iris takes over to talk about the other aspects in culture, art, and other uh, things all related to SETI. All right, let's get started. Um, I want to start by um, posing this uh, classic question that everybody uh, cares about, which is finding life beyond Earth, right? Um, and I want to sort of make a um, a little bit provocative statement, which is that um, we are the generation of humans that um, have a very large chance that can see this event happen um, as a reality um, beyond scientific fiction. And really, we, we, we have the, this great opportunity of really finding extraterrestrial life. Um, and I hope um, it'll become clear uh, as I speak. All right, so um, if we think about things quantitatively, about, about how uh, we look for biosignatures, what do we call biosignatures or life signatures uh, in the universe, there is this famous equation that we always talk about that's called Drake equation. Um, the Drake equation quantifies the number of technologically advanced civilizations in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, right? And it, as you can see, it is um, made of many components, um, 
from the radar formation of stars in the galaxy to the fractions of stars which would host planets and to the number of planets per such systems that could have host life, that have environment that are suitable for life, to the fraction of life that would eventually develop and appear, and then fraction that would have intelligence or even techno signatures, then we have to consider the overlap of time in time and also in space of such um, techno civilizations with us, right? So broadly speaking, this number of technological technological species that can have an overlap with us um, can be decomposed into two broad components in general. One is just number of habitable planets in the given volume of the universe, which of course the volume that we care the most about is our solar neighborhood. It is all about the nearby bright stars that are close to our own sun, right? Then there's the likelihood of a techno logical species arising on one of those planets. So I will start by talking about the number of habitable planets that were, we feel optimistically about uh, locating such planet. We have found actually quite a number of candidates so far, but we have not found an exact second Earth that is a Earth mass or Earth sized planets on a one year orbit around a very much sun-like star, right? So that's something we're still in hot pursuit at the moment, then my colleagues will talk about the other part where we directly search for techno signatures. All right, so I said that we're pretty optimistic about finding a Earth-like planet, and this is not based on fiction, this is based on evidence, right? Um, I'm gonna show a movie which will show a suite of real extra solo um, planet systems that were discovered by this marvelous satellite called Kepler that was launched by NASA. So Kepler has already finished its mission. Right now there is another satellite that two actually running in space that's taken over from Kepler, but Kepler has revealed to us that planetary systems in our own Milky Way galaxy are abundant, frequent, and very diverse, right? And extrapolating from Kepler's discovery, we can see that um, planets like our Earth that are similar to our Earth in some ways, especially in what we call the habitable zone of a star that is not too hot, not too cold, could have liquid water on the surface of the planet, could be frequent, right? So this video is just showing the diversity of planets that Kepler has found in comparison to our own solar system. This is played in sort of uh, some real time relative scale. The solar system planets are shown to scale to the extrasolar planets, but the stars are not shown, right? Because the stars are overwhelmingly large. All right, and the colors indicate the temperatures of the planets, where the blue ones are, um, would have temperatures similar to Earth's, right? You can see Earth is very small. Most of the planets we found so far are relatively large. Some are hot, some are cold. All right, let's take a look. So what you can see is that Kepler has found lots of systems with planets very, very close to their host stars, unlike our solar system, which are sparse. This is caused by what we call observational bias, because it is easier to find planets that are closer to host stars. But we also know that if you go further out for uh, planets, for example, like our Earth that have longer orbital period, um, they are pretty, they are, they are probably also pretty frequent. And we can also see that planets come in all sizes and different kinds of orbits. Some are close to each other, some are, some are further away. Some have temperatures that are similar to Earth. Some have temperatures that are really, really hot, as hot as lava, right? What we call hot Jupiters. Some come in pairs, some are more lonely. So in our Milky Way, the planets really are abundant, frequent, and diverse. So what Kepler has used is this detection method called the transit method. So it looks for planet um, that crosses the surface of the star along our line of sight, which means that to us, the planet will blocks part of the light of the star as it goes around the star. And they will do this repeatedly in a periodic fashion. And if you observe the brightness of the star, constantly you just stare at a patch of sky you can monitor you know uh, tens of thousands hundreds of thousands, even millions of stars at the same time and see if they have this dip in brightness and which could indicate that they have a what we call a transiting planet right so this is a really powerful method for detecting extrasolar planets 
and it's also um, best to die in space, but you can also done uh, from the ground. It has discovered um, uh, basically 3,000 extrasolar planets among the over 5,500 exoplanets we've known so far. And we have a suite of space missions, as you can see here. Uh, this is a um, list of space missions that are for, extra, for studying exoplanets um, that are um, hosted by either NASA uh, or the European Space a Agency, ESA, or jointly by them together, right? So we have passed the Kepler phase, which has told us that, um, uh, which has given us the confidence that um, we, uh, we, are, we, we're, um, we have a pretty large chance of finding a second Earth, and we have tests, which is solving the whole sky and finding lots of beautiful nearby um, uh, planets, including some habitable ones around smaller stars. And then we have GWST running at the moment, which looks at details of um, exoplanet's composition, which is very important. And then in the future, ESA will launch the Plato mission, which also uses transit. And also NASA will launch Roman, which use, will use another method to look for planets. So, um, and then ESA will launch Ariel, which will do exoplanet atmosphere studies. So just very briefly, GWST uses this a different method to look for planets um, besides looking at the composition of planets, um, atmosphere, and other uh, fantastic studies. Um, it uses this thing called the direct imaging, carries um, a, a fancy instrument called coronagraph that will uh, smartly block the light for the whole star and review the faint nearby planet that's too close to the star for us to observe from the ground. And the Roman Space Telescope that I men mentioned, the Nancy Roman Telescope, will discover thousands of planets via both transit and also, importantly, microlensing, which is another important method for finding extra solar planets that is sort of catching up with the transit method. So microlensing is a very special method where it uses um, Einstein's general relativity, where you have a background star and you observe the light of the background star uh, where you have a lens star carrying a planet with it and the gravitational lensing effect will be a little bit different when you have a planet vs versus when you don't have a planet. So the micro -lens lensing method um, is very powerful when you have lots and lots of background stars and you just have chance lens star passing by these background stars and letting you find planets around those lens stars via the distortion of space and time due to the gravity of the whole star and the planets, right? You're looking for tiny effects on top of um, other large uh, gravity effects. All right. So I've laid the ground for looking for uh, exoplanets from the space. Um, these methods are all sensitive to this Earth 2.0 or second Earth, Earth-like planets that we're looking for that potentially we want to look for biosignatures and technical signatures as well. Um, next, especially um, for my talk today, I want to introduce more uh, focus on the future Chinese missions, what we're working hard right now in China um, along this line of work. Um, this is, uh, of course, nowhere near a summary of the uh, exoplanet research in China, or not even you know, in terms of just looking for Earth 2.0, uh, second Earth, uh, but it's just a highlight of uh, the exciting things that are that's gonna happen sort of in parallel to this uh, picture I showed for uh, the Americans and Europeans, right? So the first one I wanna introduce is called CHESS, Closed by Habitable Exoplanet Survey. Um, this is led by Dr. Um, Jiang Huiji from Purple Mountain Observatory in Nanjing um, as part of the Chinese Academy of Science. Um, this is a very special mission as it uses a different detection method from the method that I introduced. This is um, sort of a method that we dreamed about for detecting exoplanets for uh, over a century, literally, but we have not really succeeded independently to use this method. It's called the astrometry method. Um, it uses the fact that the planet also has gravitational influence on the whole star. So it's really a binary system that orbit each other. So this whole star, which is bright, this planet is very fun, we can't see it, right? Uh, the whole star also wobbles due to the gravitational tag of the planet. So if you measure the position of the whole star and see how it changes over time, 
If it has a planet, it will be dark slightly, and compared to the background stars, you will see that it moves. And this is called uh, measuring the astrometry and the astrometric changes of the star and use that to detect planets. All right, so the CHESS mission uses this method and it will monitor a small group of stars um, that roughly about 30 light years or closer um, from our solar system is really, really close by. Um, and measuring the tiny, tiny changes of the stars in position to infer what's the mass and the orbital period of their planets. The chess is being built right now um, using the astrometer method. So the next mission, which is also very exciting, is called Earth 2 mission or uh, ET for BRAVE. As you can tell from its name, the mission itself has the primary goal of finding Earth 2. So really like this graph showed over here, Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. We have found lots of um, uh, sort of Earth size or Earth mass planets around what we call M dwarfs. These are small red stars that are much smaller than our sun, sun. So they're a little bit different. So, so they're quite different from our sun. So what do we really want is to go to the next step and find Earth too, uh, to find Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. So really, so these have longer orbital period and smaller signals. So this again uses the transit method. And what's special about it is that it picks up where the Kepler mission has left. It will look at the Kepler field where Kepler has stared at for four years continuously, but has not find a Earth 2.0. So ET, the ET mission will continue stare at the vicinity of the Kepler field and find the first batch of Earth 2 and really tell us what's the fraction of Earth-like planets around sun-like stars, right? But really, what are the odds of having potentially um, planets like our Earth maybe having liquid water um, in our Milky Way? And it is also very special in the sense that it will carry a small camera on the side and stare at the galaxy bulge where you have lots of background stars where you can do a micro lensing survey, very similar to what Roman telescope will do but on a uh, smaller scale in a different way. Um, and we also find interesting planets like very cold planets and small planets that are really floating in space as well. So this is truly exciting. This is led by Dr. Jian Ge at the Shanghai Astronomical Observatory. All right, so um, this is also a mission that's being built right now. The Pathfinder I believe, um, will be launched this year. So something to look forward to. This will, uh, the hope is to launch it before Plato. So Plato will find more Earth 2.0 and also a suite of nearby Earth 2.0 as well, hopefully. Um, but ET will tell us the first um, measured number of what what is the odd for any sun like star to have Earth 2.0. All right, so those, those missions I um, talk about, um, most of them we use this thing called a transit method. Um, to find Earth 2.0, but there is a, a slight problem with transit, the transit technique, which is that it requires a chance alignment. So the star has to pass in front of, the, the planet has to pass in front of the star um, in, in front of our eyes. So um, for a Earth 2.0, the chance of that happening, if you assume all the planet orbits are randomly aligned on the sky, is only 0.5%. So that's pretty low because you have to time that by the number of stars you want to look for um, Earth 2.0. For, for example, if you only care about the brightest nearby stars, uh, those are really only like 100 or 200 or such stars. Um, and you time that by the transit probability and you multiply that by the fraction of nearby stars that have Earth 2.0. Um, this basically means that unless we're super lucky, Otherwise, we will not have a transiting Earth 2.0 in our backyard. So this is why astronomers um, are also looking very, working very, very hard to look for Earth 2.0 from, from the ground, not just using the space missions, but also using the large telescopes from the ground as well, using this very traditional method called video velocity. So this is sort of similar to astrometry, where it uses the gravitational tug from the planet uh, to make the that makes the whole star wobble. But instead of measuring the change of position, it measures the Doppler effect of the light of the star, where when it moves away from us, 
the light of the star will be redshifted, just like you know when you hear a um, police car uh, zooms by. Uh, when it goes away from you really fast, you will hear the siren goes to a lower pitch. When it zooms in faster towards you, you hear the siren to a higher pitch. So that's the Doppler effect of sound. We use the Doppler effect of light to detect planets uh, by measuring what we call the radial velocity, the velocity along the line of sight of the star and see the periodic change of that to infer the existence of planets. So from the ground, we use this method to detect Earth 2.0. We're still trying very hard to do it. There are a suite of such instruments across the globe that are capable of doing this, that are working hard and monitoring the nearby bright stars. Every night, the instrument is scheduled on the telescope uh, very, very closely. So this has been going on for um, technically three decades. But it's only been um, not even five, maybe five years, not even five years since we have the actual precision. We have the most advanced instrument to be able to detect Earth 2.0. So we're still accumulating data. So these are some of the instruments, some of them in Hawaii, some of them are in Chile, and some in continental America as well, and across the globe as well. The ones that are being labeled are the ones, especially in the red, are the ones that have the highest precision that I like to use the most, for example, to look for Earth 2.0. But in China, what we're doing is to try to join this effort by building another new instrument which we will put in uh, Canary Islands off the shore of Africa, that's part of Spain. So China is collaborating with Spain um, to build a new instrument that will be capable of looking for Earth 2.0. Um, and once we find it, uh, hopefully the next generation space telescope, for example, the ones being uh, planned right now in the US, that's called the Habitable World Observatory, will know which nearby star to look for, look at, um, to look at, stare at the Earth 2.0, to look for biosignatures, to see if it has life, has any uh, molecules that could be ind indicators of um, uh, life on the planet, right? So this instrument we're building right now is called CORUS, the Canary Hybrid Optical High Resolution Ultra Stable spec spec Spectrograph that will go on the largest um, optical telescope uh, on Earth right now. Uh, it's the 10.4 meter uh, grand telescope hill on uh, the Canaries uh, on the Canary Islands, GTC, the GTC telescope over here. So hopefully we'll join this effort in the next five years and continue um, to find Earth 2.0 in our backyard so that um, a mission like this um, that's um, being developed by China right now that's called Ni Yin um, will characterize in detail of the Earth 2.0, Earth 2, uh, we, if we find and really tell us what's, what, what is the chance of having life signatures on such planets. So mean is a mid-infrared interferometer array uh, that will characterize Earth's like planets and search for biosignatures. We hope to launch it um, in the next two decades or so. Um, and this is an illustration not from me and because it ha has no publicly available um, illustration yet, but this is for TPF and Darwin, which was um, uh, has a similar concept, but it is, was discontinued. But me will have a different configuration, but um, uh, having a little bit of similar concept. Uh, so this is also something to look forward to. All right, so finally, I wanna um, recap um, on this equation. I've talked about uh, how we're feeling very optimistic about finding the second Earth um, with all sorts of space missions and ground-based instruments all over the world. Um, and I've introduced several Chinese missions we're very excited about and are working on uh, that hopefully will tell us this exact number, right, in our solar neighborhood um, and also beyond the solar neighborhood in the Milky Way in general. And next, I'll hand out uh, to my colleagues and they will talk about uh, safety research in China. All right, with that, I'll conclude um, um, just a quick brief introduction slide for my research group and what we do. We're called the Axel Lab at Tsinghua University. Give my email and Twitter contact if you're interested for further questions. Thank you very much. And I'll hand the microphone back to Beth and uh, Iris. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was, that was great. Um, really covered 
a lot of, of what goes on in the search for that Earth 2.0. So thank you. Um, Iris, who is up next? And our next speaker is Professor Zhang. And Bolon, he's a PhD student. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to be here. And uh, uh, just now, Professor uh, uh, Professor Wang gave a detailed uh, introduction to background of SETI and exoplanet observations. Uh, I'm I, I I work in the I'm uh, I work in the Beijing Normal University at the Department of Astronomy. And uh, uh, before my research, my research field was originally main in the field of cosmologies, and especially for the uh, theoretical cosmology and uh, computer simulation on the large scale structures. Uh, also, we major in cosmological constraints using some data such as uh, supernova data and uh, CMB. And uh, BO also have a parameter observational data. And uh, for, for SETI research work, I, uh, but uh, maybe in about 10 years ago, I really started to get to know the, the SETI research and the research field. So right now we have a SETI research team at the Beijing Normal University. Uh, for the SETI research field, it started in about 10 years ago in 2014 when I was visiting UC Berkeley. Why during my visiting Berkeley, I meet a lot of SETI researchers. And uh, by taking with them, I was surprised that SETI, a, SETI can be treated as the perfect science and uh, that there was all sort of certainty to working on it. It was that time I started to think maybe we could do it in China. And during my visit to use Berkeley, I did cut with many scientists at UC Berkeley. And one of them is the chief scientist, Dan Wismore, from the site at home, at a uh, at, uh, at home team. And also we show from the breakthrough lesson team. And we have uh, many discussion with them and they are all very positive and uh, supportive of my research idea in China. Currently, we are in close collaboration with these two teams, uh, especially with Dan Wismo and uh, Wishong. Uh, in the meantime, uh, China was building one of the largest uh, radio telescope named FUNT at that time, compared with the Arecibo telescope in America, FAT has a wide field of view and higher sensitivity, which can make FAT a perfect instrument for SETI observations. So there was a lot of discussion about uh, do, how to do SETI with FAT with Dan and uh, we saw even before construction of the FAT. Uh, in about uh, 2010, uh, the chief scientist and engineer of FAT, Nalan, Professor Nalan Dong, also wrote a paper. Uh, in that paper, he pointed out the city will be one of the major objectives of FAT, the telescope. So uh, in, in 2019, we a collaboration with the Dan and they conducted the first SETI observation with the FAT the telescope in China. And the we group right now it also explored some SETI data analysis, especially uh, the, the, the RFI rejection method. And also we are developing some observational strategy and uh, maybe also some 
uh, we also develop from some new uh, signal identification criteria. Next, my student, uh, my peer student, Bolan, will give uh, take more about uh, our site mission and uh, some site research work. Maybe next, we uh, Bolan go ahead. Bolan, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. I, I I take from that. Uh, so thank you very much for having me here. So I'm Bolan. I'm a PhD student uh, in the SATI group. Professor John has just mentioned. Uh, so today I'll be just talk about uh, some of the ongoing endeavors and uh, some of our, of our future plans as well uh, for SATI in China. Uh, so just to be clear that we are only doing uh, radio observation in China at the moment. Uh, it's just uh, this little electromagnetic spectrum band uh, uh, in the yellow shaded place. Uh, so we're doing radio uh, observations, which means that we are focused on two type of uh, uh, sources of these uh, uh, signal. The so first source comes from the uh, leakage radiation. Well, it's just something that imagine that uh, there is a ET civilization out there and they're communicating with their own satellites and uh, spacecraft uh, in, in orbit. So if we can detect that leakage radiation, uh, it's almost like we can confirm their existence and their uh, te technological uh, capabilities. And the, the other one is, is much more straightforward. It's just a deliberate communication signal, meaning that uh, they're intentionally sending this message to us. They know our existence. They know that we can, we're able to uh, receive their message in radio. So these are the two major type of uh, signal uh, we're looking for. Uh, there are some other techno signatures as uh, uh, Professor Wan has talked about uh, and biosignatures. Uh, but uh, these two are the major ones. We're still looking for others as well. Uh, yeah, so the first time we did an, an observation in China was in 2019. Uh, it was uh, in collaboration with UC Berkeley as well. And uh, it's a test, uh, just basically test our how compatible uh, were our software, hardware, and how was the data analysis pipeline working. So are they working uh, correctly? Uh, no surprise, there's no any suspicious signal found, though there are some uh, candidates, but uh, uh, they were like uh, quickly, uh, 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 they're quickly, you know, we confirmed them as uh, those interference uh, later on. Um, recently, we have been doing like a multiple uh, surveys on exoplanetary system and uh, nearby stars. Mm, for those exoplanetary system, uh, because of their, some of those has this uh, habitability that as like Professor Wan has just talked, uh, we look for those uh, civilization that uh, that may be you know the possess a similar environment as we do, so there has a higher chance that they can uh, possess a technological advancement. Uh, so that's why we do with the exoplanetary system, uh, but we also do with nearby stars. Uh, well, that's one of the uh, biggest advantage of fast because fast is able to detect those very faint signals uh, from these nearby stars. So here is a comparison. So if you look at the right image, uh, so there's a very critical uh, parameters in SETI, we call it EIRP. Uh, it stands for uh, equivalent mesotropic radiated power. It's just a measure we use to basically to say that, okay, so what's the minimum uh, power we can detect from an alien uh, transmitter. So here is the, so we calculated this value uh, from our recent survey, one of those survey. So this is a hypothetical transmitter on Bonnet star. So that's about, uh, I believe, five light years away from us. It's the closest uh, stellar system uh, to, out, to Earth uh, in the fast observ observable uh, sky. And you see that the ERP here is 10 to the power of eight, uh, I think units is watts. 
And uh, just to give you a sense of uh, scale, if you look at our one of the most uh, one of the most powerful uh, radar system, the Arecibo planetary radar, is in the is in the scale of ten to the power of twelve watts. So that's almost like uh, ten thousand times greater than what we can detect. So, and uh, I believe that I, I did some research before that uh, some of the powerful military radar can reach up to 10 to the power of nine. So that's still 10 times the detectable ERP here we have with BOST. So all this comparison just suggests that uh, if there really exists a, a civilization that possesses a similar uh, technological advancements as we do on Earth, uh, we are able to detect them. Uh, even they are maybe uh, 10, 20 uh, per, second, per second away on Earth. So that's all the stars in this uh, solar neighborhood. It's uh, fall, it fall, it fall within this uh, range. Uh, so yeah, that's one of the biggest uh, advantages of FAST, which is super sensitive. So apart from this observation, we have engineered some of the new observation methods as well. So the on-off strategy is one of the most widely used uh, observation methods. Well, the, the general principle is that uh, uh, if, you, if you, for example, you have a star to look at, so you, su you suspect that uh, there may be exist ETI on this planet, uh, let's say star A. So in order to get rid of these uh, interference, we often uh, pick pick up another reference observation. So, uh, so we do the on observation right on the star, but we do another off observation that's a reference observation to a place, a random place near the star. So, if a, uh, if it, so if there's a signal that uh, that was uh, present in both of these observation, we know for sure that this is not a, uh, e a signal from ET because the ET signal is like a sky localized um, and it's a point source. Uh, so we basically upgraded to, to this new method called MBC, MBCM. That's, that's stands for, I believe it's multi-beam co-instant matching uh, method. What we do here is it, intrinsically the same so that we have this, uh, this is the multi-beam receiver, a fast, so all these beams, they are recording information uh, simultaneously. So that what we do here is that uh, we point the center beam, the green one, to our target star. And this outer, uh, the outermost six beams, so the 18th, 16th, and, and so they, they act as this reference beam. So we can compare the, the, this uh, beam with the center beam to confirm the uh, the, if the signal is actually a NOFI uh, or an ETI signal. Now, these two methods, these on-off and MBCM methods, uh, I mean, the, the general principle is the same. So it's to compare in different beams, but there are some like interference. They could, they could just contaminate uh, only one uh, beam. So they can easily pass our uh, criteria of this uh, strategy. So. So we have uh, we have developed another strategy called MVPS, which stands for multi beam point source scanning, where we instead of tracking the star, we are basically we are scanning the star, so that uh, there's some parameters that varies. There's some parameter, for example, like the intensity, would vary with time, so that we can by looking at when does it uh, reach a uh, maxima, and uh, uh, how how did it like decrease or increase um, when the telescope is is scanning to or scanning away from the target? By looking at those parameters, we can uh, we can put an extra uh, verification to this process of uh, RFI, this interference uh, elimination. So those are the uh, methods we use. Uh, the most recent one. And uh, recently, we are doing some collaboration with the SETI at Home team, uh, the base at UC Berkeley, and we're doing some rate observation of their best candidates. So they have conduct they have been conducting these commensal observation with Arecibo uh, for I mean over 
to over 10 years or something. And they're, they're collecting some of the best uh, sky regions for, for, for us to reobserve uh, the signal. to share all these information with us so that we can do the uh, reobservation on bus. And that's one of the things we're doing uh, right now. And the next is that we're testing some new software with Br Breakthrough Listen team as well. So we're trying to explore some new, uh, like those new novel signal type that's never been searched before. For example, we're we're trying to exploring some of the um, periodic ones, the signals, uh, because uh, before that we're just doing some continuous signals. Uh, now we can we're trying to just try different signal types, not just uh, uh, continuous. Um, and what's more is that okay into the future. Uh, so, uh, in the summer of uh, 2023, uh, we've initiated this new project. It's called the Far Neighbor Project. Well, you can tell by the name, it's a, it's a SETI project. And uh, what we want to do is that we want to integrate what we have, um, just like all these instruments we have, techniques, SETI theories we have, we want to put them all together and to build a systematic uh, SATI approach in, in, in the new century. Now, two things we care the most is that the first one is the observation. We want to expand our observation, but not just in hours. We're trying to expand in other bands. As I said before, we're currently we're only do the in the radio band. But we wish to uh, you know just to expand this to other bands like the infrared uh, band as well. Uh, and also other signal types as we were doing currently with the breakthrough listen. And uh, another thing is that we're trying to do with uh, theories. So we're trying to break through, um, you know, our just current theoretical uh, boundary of SETI. And we're trying to refine some of the existing uh, theories as well. Uh, I mean, a theory to me is just, uh, it's, it's one of the most important parts in SETI because it provided a general guidance to all of our SETI researchers uh, to how do we conduct uh, SETI. And uh, I believe that uh, that day could come. I mean, the day of uh, uh, really communication with the interstellar uh, species would actually come. If only we have these universal SETI theories with them. So our theory are in a match with um, our neighbors uh, Sati and Mati theory, so we can <clears throat> we can talk about that as well. So I mean, the, the the goal is to to build a systematic approach to receive the first interstellar grating. Well, that requires a lot of things. Uh, I mean, as I said before, the the theory is one of the most important one. That's what we're trying to develop the most in this new project, but also with all the other uh, the aid of other. Uh, like observation and data analysis and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I'm all op optimistic about this. Um, well, because that we now have some of the most advanced instrument in the world and we're, we're building uh, some as well. For example, like the SKA, we're collaborating in collaboration with all the world. We're trying to build next level telescope. Uh, so yeah, so we are then able to uh, able to scan the whole solar neighborhood. Uh, if there's, I mean, if there's no nobody around, we can still go further for this dense region in the universe, for example, like the those dwarf galaxies or those Milky Way, uh, Milky Way galactic clusters as well. But that would take, I, I don't know, like uh, millions of years for a response. Um, yeah. All right, thank you, Bolin. That was excellent. Um, and I, I share your optimism, especially with all of these these new instruments coming online and and the new technology and the the increased computing capacity, really, that we have that can help us all out with this. So yeah, yeah, because like uh, I mean, like ten years ago, uh, so I was like when I was in middle school, I was a volunteer in SETI at Home uh, program because I mean they they they, they, they distributed their their work to the, our personal computers. Mm -hmm. So I was like a part of this. I wasn't really able to read any English, but I managed to join their program. Uh, yeah, so back then they need a, like, they don't have much of the computational power, but now mm -hmm. that we, we don't need that. 
sort of the volunteering works. So I believe that's going to get better as well. Yep. Yeah, very, very excited for how that that has shifted with the uh, increased amount of computer processing power and storage that we now have. So thank you so much. And um, thank you, everybody. Uh, Iris is up next. So Iris is now going to give her presentation. Iris, it's all yours. Yeah, I mean, it's really an honor to be on such a kind of interdisciplinary panel, especially um, I was actually a bit touched uh, when Professor um, Huang talked about the kind of like the history of SETI in China, which actually started like a decade ago and how like we've come so far and how we kind of get more enthusiastic about kind of um, juxtaposition of both um, theory and practice. Um, yeah, it's a really, I mean, it's it's kind of like a learning experience for me as well. And uh, I'm actually the curator on the panel. So I mostly work with artists uh, and also uh, who are interested in the sort of intersection between art and science. And I will be very briefly sharing today about um, the kind of study elements um, in Chinese contemporary art that I have observed in my personal curatorial experiences. And um, I have a very preliminary title, it's called like, From Dark Forest to Entangled Ecologies, and I will be explaining why, um, I mean, where the title comes from. So um, thinking about setting in China, I think a lot of people will quickly, very quickly jump to the idea of the dark forest, um, which is um, as um, a kind of like a premise or a hypothesis um, raised by science fiction writer Liu Cixin in his um, famous um, science fiction novel, The Three, Three Body Problem. Um, I remember when I visited CERN last year, I think like literally every scientist that I kind of talk with was telling me like, oh, I'm reading Three Body Problem. So for those who might not be entirely familiar with the theory is like, so basically basically the dark forest um, is a hypothesis that um, the author thinks that there are potentially many, many like SETI or like alien civilizations in the universe. And um, but they remain weirdly in a kind of silent and hostile fashion because um, because if they kind of, you know, become detectable by other um, civilizations or um, intelligence, they might um, be in danger of being destroyed or um, being kind of totally colonized by other types of similar civilization in the universe, um, which is a fascinating hypothesis. But actually also what I want to um, bring up here is that the the whole idea, the three body problem, the novel, and also the dark forest theory is really operating on the hypothesis that we live in a finite universe. So basically, it's because precisely because of the finiteness of both resources and materials in this universe that all the intelligence or civilizations must exist in a state of competition or rather than symbiosis. Like it's it's like we live on this kind of hostile environment purely because because of the sort of the 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 finiteness or the mutation uh, of the resource in the universe, so and then the and and then we we saw in the film like the the person the protagonist she kind of has to push the button be, and then you know like then the aliens from the other planets just began to invade Earth and that's the story of the original three body problem, and my question here is um, as I said um, what if I mean what and what will be other kind of alternative stories that have been told or potentially could be told if we do not necessarily believe that we live in a, in a context or in, in a setting that everything is limited and that we have to live on the basis of, of competition. And then can we turn the drug forest into a question rather than taking an as the kind of only um, hypothesis of thinking about interstellar um, intelligences and also uh, multiplanetary um, civilizations? So today I will be talking, kind of guiding you um, to through or for different kinds of um, contemporary Chinese artworks. And actually two of them are in a way related to the three body problem in different ways, um, but not simply inheriting the kind of the ideology or cosmology view in the original book. Instead, they kind of start from some of the context or settings from the three body problem and they in a way find other ways of storytelling. And the first, the first piece I'm going to introduce is called, it's a really long title, so it's Lithian Lake and Island of Polyphony um, by Chinese artist Liu Chuang. So the scenario of the piece is actually a reimagination of the figure um, called Sofa from the original um, Three Body um, Problem book. So in the original story, the, the, the figure Sofa was actually a supercomputer um, kind of 
embedded in a proton that was sent from um sent from the planet where the trisolarium live and then across all the interstellar spaces to lock down or kind of to slow down the progress of technological development on the earth however in Liu Chuang's film he rather I mean he kind of imagines that so far instead of being a supercomputer um coming all the way over to lock down earth so far actually turns into an the position or the role of the anthropologist out of curiosity so basically she or it comes over and travels all across the kind of like the planetary history of the earth and try to make connections between all the elements throughout the history of the earth. For example, the history of silver mining and then contemporary um, sort of the, 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 the progress of lithium mining for the progress of um, technological development um, in, for example, like smartphone industry. And um, the story really offers an alternative approach in which the author proposed the idea of polyphony, literally means that the plurality of voices or sound. And then the artist came to all the kind of, you know, like Southwest region of China and made a lot of recordings of voices and sound um, of different ethical Nara people. And actually a lot of the sound materials are also part of the golden rock that you know, we used to send to the, to the universe. And the method of the polyphony in a way um, raised up by the artist is a way to kind of, um, as a strategy or a speculation to counterbalance the sort of technological past dependency and the singular future of interplanetary competition in the original three body um, problem story. And then I'm gonna show you a very short clip uh, from Liu Chang's video and then how he kind of contextualized the original story and also maybe to get for you to get a sense of how this story kind of is rewoven into the another kind of setting. ซึกดาตาทอดีทอดีปิกกุเลคะแคปัวซุซอมนีนีเซกุเลปุมมาคจอเรียทาวชุซนีดอตระคาซึซอเกแมปุซกุเซกุเลปุงกินจีปิกก
um, the the figure of photon actually in the um in the film sorry cell phone in the film um kind of turns from a um someone who came to interrupt um science on the earth and then she kind of became an anthropologist trying to figure out what exactly happened on this planet, and the second story I'm gonna to share. And is another piece called Pyramids and Parabolas from um, Chinese American artist Alice Wong. And uh, I'm going to just show some clips uh, without displaying the sound. So basically, um, the artist was also inspired by one particular sentence from the three body problem, which is I'm going to read here. So, three days from now, between one and five in the morning, the entire universe will flicker for you. In the original story, the line was actually seen by a scientist, and he was actually basically. Um, driven mad because like this is not scientifically possible that one single person will see the kind of really dramatic um, fluctuations of the cosmic wave background flickering. But actually in the story, I mean, what the artist takes from the story is actually the kind of connection that one could potentially make between the scale or the confinement of the human body and the vastness or the kind of like pure objective scientific sort of like science um, aspect of the universe. And then in a way, I think she, I mean, the whole film is really about herself trying to juxtapose, juxtaposition um, the kind of listening of a scientific apparatus in the film, which is the fast telescope that we also kind of talk about today, and also the listening of a DIY antenna system that artists kind of build up on her own body. So it's a very tiny moment of, you know, like intersecting two modes of listening. And like, for example, in this video, which is the mechanic, the kind of really scientific version of listening to static signals. And then in the next video, it's really the artist herself trying to make all the connections and trying to build a whole listening system on her own and trying to kind of um, net, kind of weave together the two modes of listening and to incorporate the idea of that particular little ceasing sentence, which the entire universe will be flickering for one person. So as a kind of spell or it's kind of like um, making connections between two modes of listening and two scales uh, and also two kinds of um, bodies, the mechanic body and the physical body. And that's what I think in a way what the artist was trying to do here in the film. And it's really kind of a mesmerizing process looking through the whole um, whole video. Um, and the third film or the project I'm going to be introducing is also in a way discussing about the notion of the body and also how potentially the sort of embodied experience, whether it be nestling or touching or mediating, can really offer understanding of other forms of intelligence. So the artist here, I think she's also an artist um, in residence, as I said it before, um, um, Liu Xing, and she really interrogates a notion um, or another kind of body, which is the technological one. So um, to briefly introduce, she's an um, um, artist graduate from MIT, and she, I think she was one of the curators or initiate kind of person who initiated the space exploration group at MIT, in which they really offer students the opportunity to ex experience some um, space-related technology, such as the parabolic flights. And uh, in the film or in her kind of um, own practices, she's been really deeply engaged with the idea of vertical space and also orbital politics and how in a way emotional experiences can emerge um, from the discussion of the new space age and in this particular film white stone which i was also part of the production um uh, procedure and the artist fictionalized a kind of falling object from the sky which you can see here is actually a part of a rocket and she kind of elegantly connects the the fallen rocket into the mythical stories in southwest region of China. And very interestingly, in the original story, the rocket was depicted depicted as a kind of a her. So the rocket was kind of endowed with a gender. And um, the space exploration process in the film, I'm, I'm not going to show the film because it's really long, but um, it, in a way it's rendered as entanglement between the idea of you know like the whole rocket industry going outwards and then the debris as being kind of like the abandoned part of the whole kind of progress of technological de development and in the whole film I think she successfully kind of in, in a way ask a series of very interesting questions like for example why would a piece of fallen rocket as seen from the 
top left video, uh, sorry, top left image, um, when we see that sort of like the dead body of a piece of rocket, and why would that kind of trigger our empathetic experiences? And also like how does it invite us to think about the life cycle of technological objects? Okay, for example, our Siebel clubs, I think uh, three or four years ago, and then we see the sort of like the the lifespan or the kind of birth of birth and death of a series of apparatuses and equipment that we have invented to explore the universe to 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 detect steady signals and also to kind of um, augment our civilization and how to care about the kind of residues and life cycles of such you know like technological achievement and how to pay attention to our own imaginations of other forms of being for example a technological being and how that kind of um reconfigure us with the kind of like the understanding of the the sheer objects that we have created ourselves i think that's the kind of key questions brought up by this particular um practice of the the artist and also the film the white stone um and the last project I'm going to be briefly sharing about is uh, also the film piece, a science fiction film piece by the Chinese artist He Zikhe. And I'm going to show the short trailer first, and then we have a very brief introduction. Say 我还记得当我还是个出租车司机的时候Yeah, so basically the film really tells the story of a text driver who kind of, and she and her passenger accidentally enter the time tunnel. Um, and then they talk about the past and the future, like in the past when, you know, like the, the sort of the remnants of glacier um, in the region became um, part of a hydropower station. And in the future, they were literally discussing how, you know, like poses in the sky will be the future kind of navigation um, system for interstellar uh, travels. Uh, actually, I think POSA is also one of the mission, um, but, um, main, main mission of the FAST telescope. So in a way, I think, I mean, it was, I mean, it, it's like really kind of a daily this um, feel that kind of, um, kind of um, diffuses in the film. And at the end of it, you kind of gradually realize that the text driver herself may actually be another type of intelligence that is kind of embedded in our daily lives. Like she remembers everything. She remembers herself like 
millions of years ago that she is she's a shell and then she kind of pictualizes how the future you know like as a species interstellar space she can navigate um in a universe according to the guidance of house of stars so in a way the story in a way is some um, really elegant um intertwinement of three different scales of time that cosmic time data time and kind of geological time and also the the um the sort of the existence of the protagonist is actually a kind of other forms of intelligence that may be extraterrestrial, that may be um, algorithmic, that may be, uh, that they may kind of imply all kinds of possibility that is other than human. So to summarize very briefly, we started with the dark forest problem and then, and sorry, the three body problem in the dark forest theory. And then I think through a different kind of approaches um, by Chinese contemporary artist practices, I noticed in a way more like, cosmic I, I just call it cosmic feminist thinking i think and this is primarily reflected in narratives that are not so grand but also really focusing on the individual on the body and also in the even the realm of the realm of the mind and also i think the perspectives also weaves um all kinds of space exploration technologies ranging from a rocket to the telescopes uh, which are often in a way externalized like we don't we don't really think that as part of our like kind of like civic daily lives but actually the artist in a way weaves them um into specifically bodily and mental experiences and that actually in a way will influence how we understand other forms of intelligence like for example what if study or may other kind of intelligence may not necessarily be like in the three body problem book like descending from the sky like as enemies or as colonists but rather exist as in kind of embedded and distributed and entangled forms that is part of already part of um earth that is already part of our own history and that's I think that's kind of the valuable imagination provided by this kind of artistic thinking. And also in, I mean, throughout the four work, actually the four artists all have done extensive field work and also have actual scientific exchanges with both um, astronomers and um, data scientists and also um, rocket engineers to kind of provide the sort of like the heart, um, the sort of like the more um, um, reality layer um, in the sort of like science fiction thinking um, films. And then in this type of research driven artistic processes, I think also open up to all possibilities for interdisciplinary dialogues that may exist outside of the, um, the artworks themselves and then to create a more nuanced space for interdisciplinary discussion. And that's my sharing. And thank you. And this is my email, just in case you have questions. Thank you, Iris. All right. So um, that is all of our, our presentations and it is now time for our Q&A. And I noticed that we have um, a, a few questions in the Q&A. So I'm gonna ask our, our panelists to all come back on. There's a specific question that tagged to me uh, by this Zhe Yan thing here. He says, oh, okay. So what did I do in middle school? Um, That would just, I just did this random research online about SETI because I was watching some of the movies and like, for example, like Star Trek and stuff. So I was just uh, interested in that. And I uh, typed uh, SETI on and aliens in Chinese. Uh, I'm just trying to search those. And one of the link pop out uh, was the SETI at home things. And they're saying that you can do SETI at home. So I was like, uh, impressed and uh, I would just uh, downloaded some of the applications uh, and uh, I think they just do it on uh, themselves. It's just the automatic process. Yeah, there's not really much things I, I do. I'm not, I wasn't a researcher back then. Was, was that was that the um, the gateway for you to to get interested in SETI? Mm, no, I don't really know what really what's the motivation of it. I, I think SETI itself is a motivation like to yeah. my research. Yeah. So well, and I, another I, one. I, I do think mm -hmm. for yeah. a lot of people, SETI at home was their first sort of foray into to helping with that. And of course, it's a lot of people's first foray into the concept of citizen science. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the first one, uh, I think that guy is asking, do Chinese people believe there is life beyond this planet? Oh uh, well, I can't. I cannot be speaking for this 1.4 billions of people, but uh, to me, yes, of course. <laughs> That's uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, 
That's a simple question. Yes. Um, and uh, I think there's more. Oh, uh, yes. And this fatty asks, how is inspired by noise? Uh, definitely. Uh, I mean, we have a lot of population that are interested in SETI and astronomy because of these three bodies problem, I believe. And uh, especially the younger generation. Um, yeah, a lot of people have reached to me asking about these uh, friends of my friends of my friends. So that like, yeah, so they're just reaching to me through my friends and friends. They were, so has, they were so curious about this. Have all of you read the three body problem? Uh, so actually, I, I was quite uh, I, I I didn't uh, wish to uh, read it at the beginning because so I I wasn't that of a fan of these sci-fi fictions at the start because I thought that those are just pure imaginations. There's nothing solid. Um, but then I, when I started reading them, I feel like uh, it's you know, it looks good and uh, it, it, it does a lot of. Uh, it's not entirely imagination. There is some uh, scientific uh, uh, evidence to that. Yes, I think. Uh, I think that's yeah, the that condition is... of science fiction nowadays. They have a rather solid kind of layer of science. Yeah, those those hard corner ones. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the more the more hard science fiction, where there there's a basis of of the science is the basis, and then the story is on top of that, rather than the story, and you just sort of squeeze black yeah. box science things in around it. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Sharon, I you you were nodding as well. You've read it too. Yeah, yeah, I've read it. I was uh, I, I'm a fan of it. Um, I have to say that the influence of um, the three body problem on the I think um, the entire astronomy community is pretty significant. For example, I think like for my generation of astronomers, very often we're like we chose physics or astronomy as our uh, major because we read you know either um, biographies of Albert Einstein or, you know, Stephen Hawking's books. But these days when kids come to me and they told me they want to do, you know, astronomy, especially exoplanets, they're like, we read three body problems. I'll watch the movie or the television show. Um, so it, I, I would say it's a net positive and it really bring, has brought lots of um, attentions from the Sproul Society to the astronomical community, which is still a very small community compared to the U.S. astronomy community, yeah, definitely to see as well. I guess I guess I find that surprising. I would have thought it would be comparable, um, but so you're saying it's it's much smaller than what we have here? Yeah, much much smaller. Hmm. Um, I forgot the exact number, but I I think um, the total number of astronomers. Is, uh, it's a fraction of the total number of astronomers in the US, although our total population is, you know, a few times more <laughs> than the US. So we're very much a, still a developing community, especially in exoplanet, which is a relatively young field. Mm -hmm. And in particular in SETI, um, mm -hmm. I think Iris and I um, sort of almost have trouble identifying SETI expert, but we were lucky to find Professor Zhang and the Poland, who are are literally the top SETI researchers in China. Um, I feel very privileged that we've had them with us today then. Uh, Sharon, did you want to answer uh, Alan Bauer's question about using the sun as a huge gravitational lens? Yeah, yeah, I saw this question. Um, then I was like, yeah, I remember hearing about this. <laughs> um, so I actually did a quick Google search just to refresh my memory. And to my great surprise, there is actually a revisit to this idea very recently. So um, this idea was proposed uh, a, a, quite a few decades ago already. I think we, we knew that um, this is something that uh, be radically possible because if, if you think the sun as a big gravitational lens, um, the focus of the sun would be at something between 500 to like eight or 900 AU. So if you put a telescope over there, you can, you know, uh, magnify things that's really behind the sun. Um, but very recently, I think NASA actually had a, a concept, that mission concept study, seriously, 
uh, to look into the possibility of this. And it, I think with some sort of realistic solar sails that you would just propel the um, the sail fast enough to reach the five or 800 AU within 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is feasible within you know people's lifetime. Um, so, uh, and there have been also some recent papers on uh, calculating the exact optic properties of the sun as a, as a lens, which is uh, fascinating as well. Uh, so it is, I think, under discussion, but I wouldn't say that there is a mission planned, like a concrete planning phase like the ones we talked about um, today at the, at the moment. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question, Alan. Uh Bolin, um, Jonathan is asking, and you marked this one, uh, is the yeah. China study contact release process the same or similar to the process we have here in the US and the EU? Um, will the data be open for other people to, to use? Yeah, sure, yes. Uh, we're actually currently writing a paper about this, about this um, uh, you know, space laws and stuff like that. Uh, like that. So we're, we're trying to collaborate with those uh, this uh, U.S. and EU agencies as well. You know, the, the, the data would definitely be open. All the data so you can get access to them. You, I think we're planning to build a website on this, and uh, all the data will be available on that site. Okay, thank you, um, Iris. Do you want to? Well, I'm going to ask a question first before we get into the one of the these other ones, uh, and sort of for everybody on the panel. Um, what is what is one sort of misconception you feel that people have about um, the Chinese scientific community that you would like to speak to and possibly correct? Yeah, that is a hard question. Um, Iris, do you want to start for like from the art and science um, interdisciplinary perspective? Or? It's a really hard question. Yeah, um, <laughs> too many. <laughs> too many. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because I, I feel like with the U.S. having the the sort of non cooperation thing happening, and that that is very problematic. I I feel personally on both sides of the equation. Um, do you feel that that impacts the work that you're doing and your ability to get your your information out there, your your data out there, or process, or any of that? Oh yeah, totally. Um, I guess I, I guess I can start since I I got my PhD in the U.S. and I did my postdoc in the U.S. I spent twelve years in the U.S. Uh, grew up as an astronomer in the U.S. basically, um, and then because of the the wealth of men, men essentially, I think it really limits um, uh, basically essentially bans bilateral collaborations, right? Which I think limits significantly the capacity of the collaborations between the scientists in both countries, um, which is really sad because there are a lot of good things we can do together. Mm-hmm. Um, so so fortunately that doesn't stop uh, collaborations beyond the bad letter phase, right? So which means that um, as long as there, there is a third country person, this, this is completely safe and legal. Um, so that makes things um, very tricky. And I've had students who, um, was interested in, you know, participating in certain NASA events and it was just not able to do so. I think it has happened in the past for my colleagues as well. Um, I, I think within the scientific community, we all know that, um, you know, science has no border, although scientists have nationalities. And I, I, I feel both parties are trying their hard to work through um, difficulty times and uh, to be cultural, um, at least I ha- personally have not encountered uh, any sort of um, hostility or, uh, but definitely obstacles, but I wouldn't mm-hmm. say that those obstacles are from scientists. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna guess SETI is a particularly sensitive area uh, for collaboration between the two countries as well, but I know that FAST is actually having collaborations. Um, so I'll, I'll leave Bolin to, talk about his experience in this and the weather SETI, like what's your experience working in SETI, collaborating with scientists in America and across the world? Uh, to be honest, I don't feel any of this resistance going on, you know, uh, between them. It's quite opposite. Um, I, I don't great. feel anything. It's just that we're just doing collaborations. We're doing this, uh, 
uh, collaboration observations, and we we do these discussions and we share all these um, informations all together. So, so I, I joined this group, this static group, only last year, in in October, I believe, and I I was kind of surprised that uh, there's no such such thing as those uh, resistance from both sides. So we were like freely to communicate and uh, to share our dat data. Yeah. I think I think the benefit there is that um, on the one hand, I really dislike that NASA doesn't fund SETI um, and, and hasn't for uh, about 30 years now. But on the other hand, because NASA doesn't fund SETI, we do we we aren't barred from communicating and sharing the work and, and actually having these processes together. So um, I'm glad to hear that that is is not complicating things when it comes to FAST and the data that you guys are getting. Iris, have you have yeah. you like experienced anything from the the artistic side of it, or is it is it just because several of the artists you mentioned are also I think SETI Air artists. Yes, and yes. so like we're definitely working with you. So what what's your experience been? I mean, I think in a way, I I'm probably on Bolon's side on on this question. Is partly because I think I mean in the well, art and science is like rather kind of emerging field compared to more kind of like established disciplinary. So like we really work across art and science and, te and technology. And in that sense, I think in a way we have a kind of globalized community. I think Daniela is also part of this. And we are more keen on, you know, like really discussing the sort of the, um, what is the shared um, issues of concern and care rather than, you know, like, putting it back to a very kind of old-fashioned geopolitical condition. I mean, we, we do recognize that we are, like when we talk about art and science, we do have this kind of geopolitical layer and also even like historical layer um, that is, um, you know, like in a, in a way that has national borders. But mm -hmm. if we're talking about a field or a kind of discipline that is really emerging and more kind of pointed towards the future, I think in a way the sort of um, consensus here is like we are kind of, looking onwards instead mm -hmm. of you know like carrying with us all the burdens of you know, like the as i said in the one of the problems of the the dark forest like we kind of operate on the on the hypothesis that we are on the competition but actually we don't have to like it's it, there is a more kind of alternative modes of working together than the dark forest that makes sense. Um, speak so that that leads me to sort of the next point, um, and and a good segue into bringing Daniela back on. Um, Daniela can also speak to working on this sort of artistic side of things, and I believe also since we're getting close to wrapping up, I think she has some some final words for everybody. So welcome back, Daniela. Thank you, Beth, and uh, I would like to thank everyone, all panelists, for the really interesting talks, and uh, especially Iris for uh, organizing this incredible event, and uh, Beth for the moderation, and uh, uh, Yasmin Edges, which, who is uh, in the background uh, doing the technical hosting. And I would like to also add that um, these workshops that are organized in collaboration with the SETI Institute uh, for uh, assigning space um, are really trying to bridge cultural bridges across the world and uh, trying to highlight cultural uh, and scientific perspectives on SETI from all over the world. So we have been uh, highlighting uh, SETI work from South America, from the Aboriginal communities from uh, Europe, from China, and I hope we will continue showing, presenting more uh, SETI works from around the world, um, showing that wherever there are people asking, are we alone? Uh, this is already SETI research, in my opinion. So thank you, everyone, again. Thank you. Thank you, Iris, for coordinating. Thank you, Daniela, for getting us all organized and set up. Thank you, Hasmin, of course, for taking care of all of the technical sides. And thank you to our panelists, Sharon Boland, Iris, and Dr. Sheng for being here and, and talking to everybody. Thank you, everyone, so much. And thank you to all of you for, for joining in in this webinar. Um, I saw really quickly that there were people from around the world. So we had Canada, Mexico City, China, Ireland, 
England, Colombia, and the US, it looks like. So um, thank you everybody for being here and uh, we will see you at our next seminar. So thank you so much. Yeah.